we have you on our schedule this morning to, to um, speak with us about uh, H-94 and H-145, um, which we definitely want to hear your comments on. I would just say generally speaking, <coughs> excuse me, um, we're in the process of accelerating uh, the committee's work into um, uh, a piece of legislation on um, broadband initiatives, and there's a number uh, that, we're, that we're looking at. Um, so uh, we really appreciate you joining us to talk about H-94 and, and H-145. You also shouldn't feel yourself constrained uh, in talking about those things, because we're going to be looking at a number of different issues um, that, you know, that may affect um, uh, you know, may, may affect Waitsfield, um, Champlain, Telecom. So, but at any rate, I just wanted to, as a, as a precursor, to tell you that we're kind of looking at, at, at a lot of issues, um, and um, you know, members may have questions for you on some of those things as well. But, uh, thank you for joining us, and um, if you could introduce yourself for the record as we're recording these. Uh, Thank, thank you for the welcome. Yeah. Uh, for the record, my name is Roger Nishi, and I'm the Vice President of the in Industry Relations at Waitsfield and Champlain Valley Telecom. And I also come here on behalf of the independents uh, uh, of Vermont, independent telcos, um, which really go goes without saying now. It's, it's We're really not telcos anymore. We're really broadband companies. And so we still have telecom in our name, but we're truly broadband companies. Uh, we were at a discussion just recently and the, the discussion went on for, for several, several minutes before someone pointed out, well, yeah, we're, just, we're not just voice telecommunication companies anymore. Our focus is with broadband, and that's where we've been transitioning over, over the past few years. Uh, to speak on H94, we're, we are all for the additional revenues being raised. Uh, as always, we wish the state had the capacity or the will to, to actually possibly charge more, to, to build a bigger fund, to help invest in, in, in the broadband networks. But I realize there's only so much that can get moved through the various uh, intricacies over here. Um, that, that being said, I want to talk a little bit about, um, about the building of broadband networks and, and some of the things that we've encountered. And, and it really comes down to there's some emo emotional sets and there's some, some what we refer to as intellectual sets. And I, I'm working somewhat off of a, I, I would have a handout, but I'm working off of a discussion that others have, have brought up in, in various sessions and I didn't really get their complete approval to, to use their documents. Um, but in, in terms of the emotions, um, everyone thinks that their incumbent carriers don't care. We do care. We want to build broadband networks, it's a, but it's a time and money function. You can only build so much with the, with the limited budgets that are out there. Of course, there's, if there's more funding, then we can do more. Um, there's also the, the emotional concept of everyone says that they're, they're, they want competition. They want competition in these areas. Y yes, everyone wants competition, but everyone needs to think about the consequences of competition. Competition doesn't make it easy to build in areas where the environment could possibly or maybe should probably only support one line in, into, into the home. So yes, people want choice, but they need to think about, about is it really viable in, in some areas? I mean, it, I mean, we've all seen it. There, there are companies that say, it may not be viable to, for, for me even to, to build into these two or three homes that are up on the top of mountains, just be from, from the cost standpoint. And I know no one likes to hear that, whether it's the customer or you here when the, the, the constituent calls you, but there, there are some realities there that we need to look at it in some areas that are too costly to serve. Yeah, so you sure So, uh, Roger, when you're talking about the consequences of competition, and it may be that there are areas where competition is not, do you have uh, policy recommendations for us with that in, in that regard? <clears throat> I'm going to have to think on that a little bit because any time you say, I, I don't think there can ever be any poli uh, policy anymore where you say there can't be competition. Um, just, just because of the nature of the industry anymore. Anyone who has the financial wherewithal in the backing can pretty much build where they would like to build. It's just uh, the, the policy may be that the state 
doesn't want to support competing types of providers. And what I mean by that is, um, for us, I'm a big proponent of, of, of our companies, as you all are aware. Um, but it's, it's, um, it's understood that um, the upgrading and the extension of existing networks is better money spent than creating new networks. So we're there, we're established, and, and it's just building upon what we've done over these 100 years. So what I just said sounds really anti-competitive, and there are probably people here that are going to say, no way, you can't do that, but um, you, should, you should take a look at funding the existing carriers that are there and that have been there all, all these years because um, they've done the job in the past, and, and it has been found cheaper for them to build, build and extend their networks. Can I ask you a question on that? that, that um, and, and I don't have the depth of technological knowledge to, to maybe ask the, the most precise question, but a, 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 question, a concern I have on that, I'll, I'll characterize it as, um, is it possible that um, the existing infrastructure um, is being lapped by new technology, and so upgrading, making incremental upgrading uh, upgrades to existing technology, is uh, is an incremental approach that is going to be lapped by a what some in this some in your chair have called a future-proof technology. That um, putting money into incremental solutions is really no solution. So, so there, there are two sides of that. And, yeah, and, and no, that, I know. And this and, is what we're wrestling with. And, that, and that's actually an emotional thing. Everyone says, I want, I, want, I want the next network to be built. I want it to be future-proofed. Mm -hmm. and, and we at Waitsfield and Champlain Valley tell, and I think all of the other companies would say, yes, we want a future-proof. We would love to be able to jump to fiber immediately because that do, does allow us to provide the customers with the speeds into the future that we think they're going to want. <laughs> but at the same time, we have the reality of there's a lot of dollars to do that, and if we can get more bang for our buck by using the copper uh, DSL technology, which you've seen ads all of lately that say this technology is, is inadequate and it's, 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 it's not cost effective, or it, I think one ad actually said this it, it sucks. Um, <laughs> is that a technical term? <laughs> We're the first person that's used that phrase in so the session. <laughs> well, excuse, excuse me if that offended anyone, because I know back in the office that our, our, our people would be saying, I can't believe you said that. I get pretty surprised I said it too. But it, 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 it's, it allows us, and, and this is what the majority of us have done. We've continued to push the electronics farther out in the field to get. The, the higher copper speeds of the customers in, in, in the networks that we serve today. So, um, to answer your question, though, we would we would all love to jump to the fiber. It's just a matter of the, that trade off of, of getting customers, the vast majority of customers, better speeds and better services um, in a in a quicker amount of time than if we just went all fiber. Yeah, that's yeah. Sure. So, Roger, we took testimony yesterday. Uh, from CB Fiber, who um, suggested to us that um, we're going to get what we ask for and that we need to change the definitions um, of, of what funds, um, what speeds qualify for high cost and other dollars. Mm -hmm. um, the suggestion was made 100 100. What would you say to that? 100 100. It takes us immediately to, to fiber networks right. and, and so what would your response be if we said, hey, we're, we're going to change it to 100 and 100 in order for a qualifying for high cost dollars? I, I think we would all go out there and find ways to, 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 to bid on it. I mean, it's, 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 it's actually the end game we all want to get to. Um, and, and that's the network we want to get to. I use that company down in the south that, that has 100% fiber in the area. They're, they're, they're set for the future in terms of their network, uh, in terms of getting the customers the speeds they, they want. At Waitsfield, we still have 70% that aren't fiber. <coughs> Everyone has pretty good speeds, or the vast majority do, and we're close with our technologies and our network, but we didn't build fiber to everyone. What's your place. lowest speed that you have in your network? There are some people 
Now, we have saturated our market with the, the electronics in the field to shorten everyone's loops, but there are just there are these onesies and twosie customers all over, and they they probably have less than four one. Okay. So, just, so we say 100 100. Where do you start? Where do we start? Yeah. Do you start at the four one people or you start at the 25 three people? Well, you need, you need to build the network to get out to the, the, these mm -hmm. people first. And some, some of the customers along the way that are that are close to the nodes, they are probably already have the 25.3. The ones that are less than 4.1, somehow or another, we need to figure out to, how to get to them, but we need to get the fiber out to them in that area first. That, that being said, those aren't the easy ones to build to, so those are the ones that we would be looking to, if there's, if there's a way to identify them as underserved, is there a way that we can do some type of partnership grant with, with, with the government to, to, to get the bill out to those customers. Thank you. <coughs> um, do you own your own poles? Or do you? We, we do own some. You own some, so it's a, a mix. It, it is a mix. Um, so I've heard that, that the make ready work, the applications, the moving wires, all of that <coughs> can be 70 to 80 percent of the cost of running fiber. Is, is that accurate? I do not know the answer to that. I, I just know that as a pole owning utility, mm -hmm. we see both sides. And as a pole owning utility, we see the demands that are up upon us. And, and oftentimes we're waiting for other people to do their work first, mm -hmm. which slows down the process. On the flip side, we, we pay some outrageous make ready charges and the work doesn't get done in a timely fashion. So we do see it from both sides. As to the cost, I would have to go back and, and check that out. And, and when you run pressure. your fiber, do you always run it in its own space, or do you ever lash it right to your existing copper? We, we try to run it in its own space. I mean, just the... And, the and why... I mean, it's obviously a lot more expensive to do that, so what's... The, or I'm assuming it's a lot more expensive to do that. In, in, in many instances, <coughs> there, there's a copper that's there that, that we're retiring <coughs> once the fiber is there, and we just don't want to have that on the pole, so we try to take it off to, and just use the existing space that we use. Uh -huh. At least that, that's, that's been our approach. I won't say that we haven't lashed in, in, in the past, but there are times when you do lash where we did continue to use some of the copper, and then when that copper goes bad and you have to decouple the fiber from the copper, it's just, it's, it's a nightmare and it's very costly. Yeah, so, um, Roger is one of your customers. I gotta say, I'm very satisfied with the service. Thank you. <laughs> um, but uh, landlines traditionally uh, have territories and are right regulated. Or, right? Uh, broadband is not, and that's because of the Federal Communication Commission regulations. Uh, Vermont can't be the only state that's dealing with this problem with getting broadband out to rural areas. Is there anything being done at the national level by an organization of, <clears throat> of telecoms that um, they're trying to to change the uh, regulations so that perhaps maybe uh, territories can be assigned for broadband build out in rural areas? So I, I, I don't think there's going to be any additional regulation, but the FCC through its its broadband funding and, and its latest orders, they do break the, um, areas into blocks and census blocks. And those areas where there, there, there could be, a, there, if there's one person that it, it provides a competitive type of service in that area, then they, they, they look at those areas and say, then maybe we don't need to fund those and, and build to those. But then there are those without that. So. Um, is there someone doing doing something? The FCC, at the request of Congress and pressure from Congress, they finally opened up the budget. So there are more dollars coming <coughs> into all the, 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 the companies out there that do build broadband in terms of those that have been telecom carriers in the past. Uh, for, uh, for us. So it sounds like it's more difficult to get funding if, if there is somebody already there, and even if they're in your territory, for instance, a cable company that's in Waysfield, Champlain Valley te Telecom Territory, uh, the FCC or the FTC, whoever's doing it, Ag Department of Agriculture, mm -hmm. will look at that and say, oh, they already have access. 
So we're not going to put any money there. Is that, that the way it works? It, it has worked that way in the past, and, and some of the grants and, and the broadband funding, they do look at that. But this this is where there's disagreement within the industry on, on, on the looking of, of services within census blocks. If one customer has the ability to get better speed, that doesn't mean that the, the, the whoever is built to everyone in that area. So at the federal level, we, we say that there needs to be a really a, a, if someone claims that they serve an area and that there shouldn't be funding, there needs to be a robust challenge process and where, where companies can actually challenge uh, the, the maps that are out there. Because they're working off of, of maps and, and reporting that's, as you're well aware, mapping isn't easy and the maps they're, they're referring to are right now are a couple of years old. So every, um, th th there do does need to be that, that given that you need to look at areas in a more precise manner than, than some of the uh, analysis that's been done in the past. And assuming that that challenge opportunity is exists, uh, who would be responsible for doing the challenging? Would it be the telephone companies or would it be like the Department of Public Service or what? So, so in this instance, in the way it was written in the past, it, it, it's always been the, the telco needs to, to, to bring it up, and then the person or the company that claims to have the service there needs to prove that, that they do. Okay. That's all the question. Yeah. And, and then, of course, it would go back through the whole process of the FCC or RUS who are doing the funding. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to continue on with a few other items. Please do. Thank you. And, and th th this comes to, as we start talking about every uh, other networks and, and, and looking at towns and so on, everyone feels like they need to own the investment, <clears throat> own their own investment in their town or wherever. That that may not always be the best case. It may be better to, have, to own it. If, if they do own it, they may not be the best one to run it. It, it may be something where we need to look at partnerships with the towns and, and others because uh, it's not easy and this is I'll, I'll do use a contrast which talking to some power company people about the customer calls up and calls the power company I don't have power power company reports back well it's gonna be back on at such and such time or look at look at look at the maps or there's already an automated system saying when will we be back on they call up and say well my stove isn't working well, they said at that point in time, it's, well, call your, call your local, local appliance store or call your electrician. Move forward to broadband. We, we get, and, and, and this is why some, some electric utilities have shied away from this. We get to call and it's, um, my service isn't working. Well, well, what do you mean by service? Uh, I'm not getting the speeds that, 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 you, that I'm paying for. And then at that point in time, well, where's your router? Where's your Wi-Fi located? Do you have Wi-Fi repeaters? So there's a whole lot of additional steps that we, we, we look at um, in, in terms of servicing the customer. So that's why when, when I say um, everyone's not may not want to go into the depth of detail in, in providing the, the services that, that customers <coughs> do on demand today. Um, I'm going to move on to the next point because I, yeah. I sort of lost my thought as to where I was going to go with that. Um, th this is one that ev everyone says, and, and, and it, it's true, but everyone does say this, is without high-speed broadband, my, communities will, my community will fail. Well, everyone can make that claim, and, and it's, it is something that's emotional, but I think we need to step back and, and, and look at the, from the facts once again. How are they defining high speed? Does it need to be everywhere? Does everyone, even if they have the high speed, did they subscribe to that? Um, and, 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 and this is something I think I brought up before is oftentimes when you upgrade networks, and if you jump from, say, a speed of 10 over 1 to 25 over 25 or 25 over 3, there's often an additional charge. Customers don't often want to pay for that additional charge, even though they're getting a higher speed and a higher level of service. So what we found in, in some instances where we actually put in the fiber is we're using fiber as a delivery mechanism in the home. If the customer has had, had 10 over 1 
and we give them a free trial of 25 over 25 for, for a certain period of time. And then at the end, they don't want they don't want to subscribe to the service because what they've had is found. So there is some education that needs to go on about speeds that are delivered and the, and the medians that are delivered and, and, and the cost differentials. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is their customers they get a lot of demands, and, and, and I don't know what percentage of the companies. It is the most, but it's probably the vocal two or three percent. They yell and they demand that they need fiber. And you already have copper plant there in which they can get very good speeds because they have very short loops. And they're not even subscribing to higher speed service, but they want the fiber. Um, so, 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 so those are some of the instances where I think we do need to ed do the education of, of the customers and the communities. I won't, I won't say that fiber is a need in some instances because if, if I'm an architect or a doctor and I need to upload high, high um, volumes and um, very large files, I want the additional speed to do so. And, and with the copper plant, um, sometimes we, we just can't get enough speed for them to do so. Okay. Yeah. So, Roger, just um, it seems to me that um, technological advances they're happening faster and faster and consumer needs are changing uh, the more you know technology improves and, and the speed of all of that seems to be increasing not staying the same but decreasing and so <clears throat> when we think about what um, people need for modern life um, can you talk about your um, the incumbent's ability to adjust to um, the, how quickly you're able to adjust. Like our, so you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So uh, technology is rapidly changing. Um, how do you find that you all are able to adjust to meet that need? And to all of your people or to some of your people? So, so speaking for, for the majority of us, I mean, as small companies, we're, we're pretty nimble in that if, if changes are coming about, and I'll use Kim for an example here, if she gets a call, she knows what she's going to have to install, she knows how, that she's going to have to go learn the technology, and, and she'll do so um, just to meet the continuing needs of our customers. So a, a, as an industry, we've always been at the forefront of the, the, the delivering whatever the, the, the best technology was at the time. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll take our DSL network. In some instances, we're on the third or fourth generation of, of various types of DSL in some offices, just because of what we've installed over the years to continue to upgrade the service to the, to the end users. Now, today, all those upgrades, we want them to be fiber, and that's, that, con that continues to be our focus, is to just invest as much fiber as we can each and every year. So, I mean, I just asked the question because, you know, your networks, thankfully, you know, we're only at 4-1, you know, I mean, there are networks where we're not even there. So, um, so just wondering about how quickly, you know, we're able to do it. As part, at the federal level, as part of the funding, and, and I know this has been a complaint of everyone all along, is it's with their first levels of funding, it was like they defined broadband as 4-1. Mm -hmm. And then, and that was because based on the amount of budgets out there, that's what they could fund. And then they increased it to 10 over 1, and now it's at 25 over 3 now that they've increased the size of the budget. So they're, they're saying that, that build a 25 3. And you're saying, oh, the FCC is telling people to build a 25 to over 3. In a lot of instances, that's still a copper network. So they haven't even made the jump yet to future proof our networks. Yeah. Thank you. Few other things. I'd, yeah, go ahead. I, 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 I'd like to let you finish, yeah. Roger, right yeah. and then we'll we will take as much time as of yours as we can with questions. But okay. uh, if, if you can finish, I, I'd just like to say that th these are some of the things that people are starting to see more and more. It's, it's that <coughs> deploying broadband in rural areas. It's just not economic in many instances, and, and that's why it takes longer to get there because it's. It, co it costs more. And then when you get there, if you continue to sell the same level of services you've always served, it, it, it just doesn't pay for itself. So that's just a, a reality that we need to live with and, and that will always come into play as people are looking at networks. Um, and, and I'll 
I'll leave it that beyond that, that any funding that comes from the state or local, it does help. It, it does help in the building of networks. And we're looking and we're talking to towns more and more and, and other, and even groups of neighborhoods about are there ways in which we can get to you faster with, with some um, contribution from, from those that live in those areas. Um, so my understanding with, with uh, fiber is that the, once you've installed the, on, the, on the cable itself, the, the potential is essentially unlimited and it's the hardware on either end switching on either end that that is the the, the limitation and is there <coughs> um, I mean so that like the difference between the, the equipment that will provide <coughs> 25 over 25 versus 100 over 100 is that um, I mean is it twice as expensive when, when you're budgeting this you know obviously it makes sense to afford the best that you can or the highest speeds you can I mean, are we looking at double the cost for that upgrade, or is it a you know four times the cost, or it, can it, you just? It's it's not really it. four times the cost. It's often just the modem or whatever piece of equipment we put in the customers' homes, and and in many instances, it's the difference of programming the customer from twenty five over twenty five to to a gig. So, so it could so. just be a programming. Yes. And is it something you you, you do? In every house, or is that done centrally? So, uh, it is. It, it can be. It's done individually with through speaking to whatever piece of equipment they do, that yeah. they do have in their home. Okay. Yeah. Um, have any towns uh, in your territory approached your company uh, to kind of contribute <clears throat> to helping build out the broadband in certain areas? Um, Not or towns themselves. Yeah, towns themselves. Yeah. We we've, we've talked about it, but when it always comes back to, well, it always then comes back to, well, where's the money going to come from? And so then it sort of stalls at that point in time. Yeah. There's been a discussion, but nothing mm -hmm. ever happens. I can just imagine the select board deciding to put money toward one neighborhood broadband and then yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh your answers to the, to the questions I have may be anecdotal or maybe they're, mm -hmm. you know, some specific uh, statistics, statistics that you have. In, in, your, um, in, in, in your footprint, how many of your customers uh, are served by, um, you know, have multiple options? Um, you know, where they've got a cable line going by their house, they've got you guys going by their house, maybe they've got a wireless um, access. How competitive is your, uh, is your territory? Well, well, let me start with the wireless for first. Supposedly, yeah. everyone, well, based on the yeah. maps, has wireless <laughs> and access within the state. Yeah. Um, <laughs> even though that's be, I'm, you know, I'm being no, sort of <laughs> smart yeah, out with that with what's going on in the state. Um, so. um, but in terms of that, uh, I'll say in the Champlain Valley area, probably seventy percent have. An option. Uh, two options that you have are two hardwired. Options. Yes. Yeah. And and that may be a bit much. I haven't looked at those numbers yeah. as of late. <coughs> In the Waitsfield area, we're cable company and the broad broadband company. Right. And those so, are probably closer to the town centers. Um, but as you get away from the town centers, it's probably just you guys. Uh, well, in 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 in, Wait in Waitsfield, since we do both, it's us everywhere we serve yeah. in the Mad River Valley. Yeah. Um, but but not cable. Cable presumably is on the paved roads, kind of going through the. Actually, because they took the telecom approach when the cable network was built, yeah. cable went everywhere. Okay. So it does go everywhere in the, in the Waitsfield area, except a little section up on a mountain, which um, was very costly to get to. Yeah. What, I think Laura was saying, what does that mean, telecom approach, cable to the telecom approach? Oh, the telecom approach of universal services we build to everyone on our network because the more people that are connected to the network, the more valuable, and everyone deserves the right to be able to communicate. So you have a so, cable company that did that in Waitsfield? So as Waitsfield Cable, which was owned by the telco, I see. I see. That they took oh, okay. that approach. Yeah. Oh, okay. And so, um, so it sounds like a relatively competitive territory. Um, where you are, uh, you know, vying with um, 
with another potential broadband solution for yeah. customers? Very, very much so. In 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 the the cable competition is very formidable. They're they're the speeds that are d they're able to deliver and with the bundling of their services with their video they have very competitive packages yeah. and and that's that that is a worry for all the telcos out there can we invest in the areas where there's competition quickly enough to offer the services that that would compete <coughs> and at the same time improve the services in the areas where there isn't competition because we don't want anyone to be left behind so does this settle out such that um, uh, people who want very high speeds um, are probably going to go with the cable solution and people who are satisfied with 10.1, 10.1 gets it done for them or 25.3 so, you know, may, uh, you know, may choose the, 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 uh, the telco option. I'm curious how the market kind of aligns itself. I, I won't go that far yet because many people are, are still staying at the lower level of speeds because that's what they found that they, they, they can they can get away with. they can get away with so in, in a lot of the areas where, where there is has been the overbuild and there's a the competition it's um it's close to where our central offices are so we've been able to provide pretty good speeds and yep. 25 threes and so on to compete it comes down to <coughs> a, a pricing and and ability to compete with some of the short-term pricing offers that are out there by by, by the competitors right uh, one, 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 can I, yeah. one thing I didn't mention when I was talking about the networks that we build, and, and a lot of that is 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 we still and we're the carrier of last resort. We there, there are areas where there hasn't been anyone, and there isn't going to be anyone, and and we'll continue to, to to serve in those areas. And so when when I talk about the more competitive areas, they're the. Um, so I'll use VTEL as an example. Springfield, for us, it's the Hinesburg, Richmond, and, and, and uh, Bristol areas. But you get in the areas of Addison, Panton, and Weybridge, and, <coughs> and uh, those are the areas we wish cows could be connected, and, and we could connect all the cows, because then we would have a lot of customers and bring down our costs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. um, um, so in terms of, of uh, build out, and I, or, and I guess that you have, you said you have cable going, I mean, uh, fiber running by most places, but not necessarily a drop to each house or mm -hmm. low take rate. Um, and in t so in terms of looking for, for money from municipalities or any other source, um, and whether it's for connecting copper that's already, I mean, connecting copper that's already there or upgrading your copper plant, um, what what kind of money is useful? I mean, is, you know, is a, like, if you're looking at a neighborhood, is $15,000 useful, or do you need $250,000? It, it, it really depends on the, the size of the neighborhood and the number of homes. We always figure that, um, and, and, and I'm gonna have to check on this, a lot, a lot of the drops, we, we estimate them first thing out, it's going to be 1000 to $1,500 from, from the main line into their home um, to get that done. And uh, to get the main line out there is, is an out there. That can, that can vary, in, and it varies based on the pole attachments, the right-of-ways, and so on. So I'm just wondering, you said, I thought you said that, um, that Waitsfield Telecom also has a, has a cable? Mm -hmm. Subsidiary, mm -hmm. and uh, and and you ran the cable subsidiary ran cable to almost every address. Mm -hmm. So all those addresses could have access to uh, higher speed than twenty five three by cable. Is that right? If if we upgraded our cable network to the the more current levels of service, um, ah, we're, okay. we're we're sitting on an existing okay. RF network that that doesn't have the capacity to, to deliver a lot of the speeds. All right, and, and there are other cable companies in, in, that, that are competing with Waitsfield Cable in portions of your territory also. Uh, competing with Waitsfield and Champlain Valley Tell in the, in the Champlain Valley area. So yes. it's really delineated by the, the, by the, the mountain. Oh, okay. okay. All right, thanks. I was just trying to clarify that. <coughs> <clears throat> I, to follow up on that, I, I think what I'm hearing you say is that the Mad River Valley 
is only served by Wakesfield Tel. Yes. And for both cable and phone. Yes. Okay. Yes. And in and, and, and the Waitsfield area, I, I think in, in terms of, of unserved, the, 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 the numbers aren't there as, and I won't say un unserved, that de definition is always moving, and I'm not sure what we've defined, I can't remember what we've defined it as here, but in terms of, of building networks, the, the challenges do really sit in, in, in the sparsely populated areas of, of, of Addison County. Thank you, Roger. So, um, yeah, when you're ready, yeah. I, I don't have anything to um, put up there yet because I have to correct the spelling before I do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. So, um, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to testify on. Um, H160. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think, interestingly, it's such a conversation that's tied into all these other things that are going on in this building, <coughs> economic development, um, the active 50 discussion, um, all kinds of things. Um, we're working very hard to, um, with the Agency of Commerce and Community Development to foster growth size investment in our towns and cities and villages. Um, we're hosting an economic development forum on March 27th, and I thought I would just pass around the brochures. It's going to be up at Burke Mountain. But really, we're talking about ways to take advantage of what's unique in your community and build on that. Um, and that's what we really need in Vermont. Um, but you heard about the difficulties in growing the economy um, without adequate broadband <coughs> cell service yesterday from local officials who were here for local government day. Growth, including, I think, maintaining the status quo is unlikely in areas that don't have broadband or cell infrastructure. We believe that the infrastructure should be treated much the same way other infrastructure is, and by that um, we mean wastewater, stormwater management, water supply, electricity, landline telephones back in the day, and that broadband and cell service is a necessary component of keeping Vermonters connected, engaged in the economy, and safe in emergencies. So we support the direction of H160, H145, and H94, and I know you've got other bills in here, but we didn't um, really look at them in any great detail yet. Yeah. So um, just going through H160, um, based on conversations we've had with local officials since the idea arose, we doubt that most municipalities would actually use general obligation bonds to fund broadband deployment if that were made available to them. Um, the municipal bond bank, having said that, the municipal bond bank has funded renewable energy projects, streetscapes, public facilities, wastewater treatment and water supply, um, parklands, bridges, municipal vehicles, and school construction. So they have a pretty wide variety of um, things that you can bond for. Uh, the, the key is that most of those, I think all of them really, are owned by the municipalities and operated and maintained by the municipalities. So that's something that would need to be figured out um, if a town was thinking about having someone other than, the, than a municipal entity. Um, own or operate or run um, a community utility district or something like that. In addition, I just note that um, you'd need to convince not only the select board of the advantage of using um, general obligation bonds, but there is a vote of the town required to um, give the select board permission to actually bond, so that's an additional step with respect to those kinds of financial instruments. 
Yeah. We do believe that a broadband expansion loan program would be very helpful. Public works projects, especially um, water and wastewater, are funded with revolving loan funds. And so um, substantial shares, I would just note that substantial shares of those dollars come from federal sources. And we think part of any program um, to finance uh, broadband expansion or cell service expansion might be well served to look for federal dollars to apply to, to those kinds of projects. And um, I know that the Northern Borders Regional Commission eligibility has been extended statewide now, and that might be a potential source for um, dollars for those kinds of projects at the local level. Yeah. Uh, a source for building, planning? Um, I, I think, I'm not an expert in Northern Borders Regional yeah. Commission, but they are providing some funding for wastewater treatment up yeah. in East Burke. They uh, have provided funds, I think, for planning and other kinds of things. Yeah. I think their criteria are pretty broad. So, and this is the first time it's been extended statewide, so we're um, pretty happy about that. And I don't have the dollar amount that's available. It's not insignificant. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so um, are you suggesting that we kind of um, steer away from general obligation bonds? Well, um, so to tell the truth, yesterday I was thinking that. Um, I'm not so convinced today, having looked at the kinds of things that have been funded with general obligation bonds. For instance, vehicles, fire trucks, you know, what's the useful life of a fire truck? It's not actually all that long. It's not 20 years. So um, I think, I mean, I think it bears more discussion, I would say. Um, and possibly, I know you had the municipal bond bank in here, but I don't know what they, if they discussed the particular issue of general obligation bonds for these kinds of projects. I think they'd be better qualified to talk about it than me. Um, <coughs> however, I've backed off my no, don't do that, that I was walking around with a few days ago. So um, just for the record, we do oppose section two of the bill, which would make permanent the exemption from local review that's now enjoyed by telecommunication companies when they're trying to locate cell towers. Um, we don't think the position is in any way counter to our need to provide coverage for cell coverage throughout the state. But there are um, towers proposed in places that are not appropriate. And if you decide to pursue that section of the bill, I would really ask that you hear from the town of Waterbury. They just won a case before the Public Utility Commission um, against Verizon and their proposal to put a tower on North Hill um, which is a forest block in, in, down, in very close to downtown Monitor. Um, clearly, what was, what was the issue there? Well, it was a 93 foot tower and it was in a forest block and it was the forest block or the forest area. Um, was host to a wildlife corridor, a significant wildlife corridor. The Public Utility Commission, as I understand it, was pretty clear that they were being specific in talking about that particular parcel and didn't want their, um, that decision to be a precedent with respect to forest parcels generally. But uh, the town of Waterbury did spend a, a pretty significant amount of money on, and quite a lot of time um, that particular proposal. So and they would love to talk PUC about it to you. <laughs> did or did not give us a certificate of public good? It did not. It did not, okay. Well, but if the, so we're talking about the sunset provisions of 248A, yes. um, but if that <coughs> sunset provision um, were eliminated, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, uh, um, somebody wants to put up a tower still have to go before the PUC so um, so how would that how would that um, so if the it, it's complicated because of the way it's written in the law but if the um, 
if the right now a, a telecommunications company goes to the Public Utility Commission for their permit to put up a tower, we think it's appropriate that municipalities have regulatory authority over that as well. And the fact that this sunset provision has been extended, I don't know, six or seven times by now, um, is because every time there's a proposal to do away with it, local officials come in and um, fight about it. Um, but again, I'm, sorry, I'm trying to understand what would be different um, about they would the have particular to, case that you just cited. They would have had to go before the Waterbury um, Development Review Board or, or Zoning Board. I think it's a Development Review Board in Waterbury. And they would have had to get a permit from the town of Waterbury. In addition to the BUC? Um, probably, yeah. If, if the provision had sunset. No, the, 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 so the, so yes, I, yes, I'm yes, sorry, yes, 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 if the provision okay. had sunset, okay. yes, right. so if you but make the provision permanent, then municipalities will have no, except to go to the PUC, yes, yes, okay. I'm sorry, okay. so you, just to clarify, you would like to see that sunset or not? We would like to see it, we, we would like, that you want to we would like the law to, to say that you have to go to the municipal um, uh, board for a permit for a cell tower. As was the, and not, so before, I mean, I don't want to get tied up in this because I'm not sure how, um, how likely it is to go forward, but, but um, before that law was enacted, um, if a municipality had a telecom ordinance, the, um, any company that was proposing a facility in that community had to um, get a permit from that town. It was generally part of a zoning bylaw, and not all towns had that provision by a long shot, but some did. Um, we also agree with, I think, a lot of your discussions that municipalities need technical assistance in order to plan, finance, and implement community broadband projects. And we think the, we think the, think Vermont Innovation Fund um, could help secure that assistance. Um, we also think it'd be very helpful to have staff who could at, at a state agency who could help towns work through issues that arise in the course of trying to plan um, a utility district and implement uh, and build out broadband uh, projects in their community. Um, we, we think that the Agency of Commerce and Community Development might be a good place to lodge that kind of staff capacity because, um, two reasons, because they do have a history in, um, of helping municipalities through um, a variety of different programs, and, the, and they also have um, spearheaded economic development efforts in the state, and so those two issues, I think, would naturally be entwined if they were in, if they were in the same agency, and that would probably be helpful to economic development efforts and to broadband deployment efforts, but that's that's just a suggestion. So, um, so I have a, a <coughs> question that I, I was asked to ask you, okay. <laughs> and it's uh, the <coughs> the concept of, of the communication union districts mm -hmm. or the, the readies, um, all of which are tied <coughs> to a place. Yes. The concept, and, and they are municipalities. Yes. In essence, the concept of a free floating municipality. Right. To which it wouldn't be tied to a grand list, so it wouldn't have taxing authority. Right. But it would have democratic yeah. elected boards. So we've, um, we've <coughs> talked about that a little bit um, because I've been asked about, you know, what about a virtual district? Mm -hmm. And um, we. We're, we wouldn't dismiss it out of hand, but I think that there's a lot of uh, pieces that we need to be you nailed, know, resolved before you could actually do that. I do think that if, I mean, and in conversations with local um, select board members, that if there was that kind of a district, 
and it applied to that municipality, you know, to people in that municipality, that the select board would want to have some say in how, um, you know, how the district works. I mean, even if you think about, I think all of our districts now, we have a, about 20 different kinds of districts. They're all um, tied to geography. But even if you think about something like a solid waste district where um, most, all, almost all, I would say, of the administrative functions of that district are um, given away <coughs> by the town, and the district does it all, there's still some representation on the board from that, from those member municipalities, and, and there is some capacity to vote up and down a, up or down on a budget that's um, that's being proposed by the district. So I I think there's some issues that need to be resolved. Yeah, I'm thinking it in terms of a, a communications union union district, and we're a bit, we've been talking about the difficulty of standing <coughs> up one of those. Yes. Yeah. And I think so. What if it could be stood up and apply here and here and here rather than? I guess the question here. is. The, the question that concerns people is like, who's in charge? Like, what what does this thing look like? <laughs> oh, okay, no worries then. <laughs> I mean, good good question. I just I think it's a, an interesting approach. Yeah. To, to throw yeah. on the table. Yeah. I mean, so, I'm, so I'm not, actually not. I'm not that familiar with co-ops. <laughs> but, but co-ops might be a similar model. I don't know. Like they're not tied to a specific municipality. No, no, it's a, it's a, it, it's a, a consumer co-op is owned by the consumers. There are different co-ops that are owned. There are co-ops that are owned by businesses um, and, and other kinds of co-ops. It's not uh, usually. Not in, in its organizational structure that it's to, it has a geographic limit, although let's say a food co op is obviously going to attract people from a geographic area. Right. A credit union is <coughs> attracting people staying mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We do think that um, it makes sense to extend universal service fees to. Um, prepaid telecommunications and other kinds of telecommunications. Say that again, Karen. We do think one of your bills is um, H 145, which would require retail sellers of prepaid wireless telecom services to collect the universal service charge. And we think that would be helpful. I mean, the landlines are, there's fewer and fewer of them. I'd get rid of mine if I could. Yeah. So it already applies to this, just change how yeah. it's collected. Okay. Yeah. Uh, instead All right. of having ATT submitted, it, it would be the retailers. But we do have a bill that's looking to you, you increase the have... universal service fund fee from yeah. 2% to 2.5%. Right. Yes. Which, that's which, H94. Right. Yes. Which would yes. raise money to go yes. into yeah. connectivity. Is the league support that also? I think that would be helpful. I mean, we're, we're, uh, the question is where are you going to find the revenues to um, you know, implement these programs? Okay. But I mean, that's really the entire question, I suppose. Yeah. So, that question, you know, where are we going to find the revenues? I mean, right now, we are working on proposals that largely say municipalities, like here's an opportunity for you yep. um, mm -hmm. to yeah. um, have more control finance <coughs> to mm -hmm. finance some of this. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's yep. right now yeah. where we're seeing. Right, right. Then you, I mean, <coughs> towns do assess fees for different purposes. You, you get a be on your wastewater um, use, you get you get all kinds of things. Stormwater management fees in, in a bunch of towns. So 
there, there are a lot of models out there with. But, um, yeah. Anyway. So the geo bond question, which, it, which seems like it's kind of central to this proposal, um, I don't know if you've heard from Paul Giuliani, who would um, completely, he would say no, it's not a good idea. Mm -hmm. But he does, um, he, he is the person that's done more municipal bonding than almost anybody else in the state. And so um, I think he would have a really good fix on the details of what might be involved. So Paul's going to testify next week. Okay. As is, um, I'm not sure if it's going to be the state treasurer or one of the deputies, but we're going to hear from them as well. Okay. Um, we heard from the bond bank yesterday. Yeah. Um, yeah. And they certainly raised, you know, quite, actually I would say the testimony we've heard so far on this, reservations have been raised. Yeah. Not don't do this, but yeah. here, are the, here are the potholes. You've got to be careful right. uh, of as you're navigating the reference. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the things that has been raised is, um, you know, a concern, and this is directly to your point, I think, a concern in making sure that municipalities, individual municipalities, I'm not talking about a CUD, right, right. but individual municipalities can retain the power yeah. uh, to, if they don't want to be part of something that is geobonding, mm -hmm. that they have the ability to step away from that. Right. Um, right. Yeah. And then I would say some of the other things we've heard, and we've talked about this outside of this formal setting is um, uh, circumstance that has moved forward in New Hampshire that we'd like to know about, which is right. an instance where <coughs> an individual municipality mm -hmm. um, is working side by side with a private entity right. using geo bonding to support uh, infrastructure <coughs> uh, build up in the town. Um, we don't know enough about that case study yet, but we're yeah. eager to learn. So we do, we do have a proposal, and it's got a bill number now, H241 in the House, that would set up a pilot program for municipal, where municipalities could apply to a board for a self-governance authority, um, and it's a 10-year pilot program. That's the way it's um, written in the bill. It's based on the West Virginia model that's proven to be quite successful in that state. It's just like outside but, of Dillon. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, or actually, within the confines of Dillon, because that's, I don't want to get into all that. It's yeah. apparently constitutional, but, but whatever. So, um, uh, so if a municipality were to um, acquire that self governance authority under the, um, you know, the aegis of the board of a they could then ask for authority for geo bonding for those kinds of things. They could, they could um, come up with new ideas that we haven't thought of yet for deploying broadband, um, and and be able to do it without having to come back and seek permission from the um, legislature. So, in some ways, and in a, and in a lot of arenas that we really might not think about, um, it would unlock potential for municipalities to, um, you know, move the ball down the field on a lot of these issues. The experimental phase of Yeah, university. yeah. It um, is a 10-year pilot, so... Um, I have four towns who would be interested in being one of those pilot towns. Yeah, yeah. We were getting quite a few that would sure. want to do it. Probably about 200. No, 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 really not. It's interesting. It's interesting. Some, some towns don't want to be first. A lot of towns don't want to be first. So. Um, any other questions for Karen? So please stay in touch with us, particularly in the next two weeks. The yeah. geo bonding okay. thing is something that we're going to, I think, work pretty hard on figuring mm -hmm. out, or okay. trying to figure out that question. And I think that's very relevant to <coughs> kind of yeah. your, your, who you represent. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.